Welcome to our discussion in field 307, rationalism for main campus. This should be our discussion on Plato's rationalism. And this is our fifth session together on substantive content after the introductory session and we can in all seven contact time together, uh, six contact times together. We want to engage Plato's rationalism now we are looking at the philosopher or thinker we, we call Plato and why it would make sense for anyone to think of him as a rationalist. What in his philosophy, whether in his metaphysics or in his epistemology, or if you like his sociopolitical philosophy, can one pull out to make the case that for so-and-so reasons, we will think of Plato as rationalists. And now that we've gone through the intuition deduction thesis, innate knowledge thesis, innate concept thesis, we've looked at even the superiority of reason thesis, the indispensability of reason thesis. We have seen various ways of conceptualizing the viewpoint called rationalism. It is a good time to now properly, to a, a larger extent, engage a specific author that we would want to name as rationalist. And that person we have in mind is Plato. What did you see in Plato? I don't like the IDs, okay? Put your name, because I want to engage you. I can use your name to trace you on, online. I can't be mentioning IDs to reference people. It will take the whole time. So put your name and take off your ID. That thing is not even safe for you if you are conscious of numbers and what they stand for. So just take it off and put your name. Names, we share them. There are several Nancy's in the world. So you do Nancy Miles, and there's the Miles that will help me know that you are referring to SMBC, not to Benton. Okay, put your names there, please. I'm I'm taking attendance. I want names so that I can call you for you to respond. Okay. Quickly, quickly, quickly. So some of you have your names there, and you will tell me what you read in Plato's rationalism quickly. So anyone wants to take take a start? You want to raise your hand? Look at where the raise hand button is at the top there. After chat and people and what have you there, look up the uh hand. -huh. Very good. And then you can select, you can raise your hand over there. I want more hands. What did you say in Plato's rationality? Put your hands up, please, respectfully. Let's let's move eh? so that we don't have a very lengthy recording. We can do the substantive discussion in about 40, 50 minutes and still continue with the lecture in two hours where we'll be doing the interactive interaction. Then I can pause the recording. So that if you have to play it back, you go straight to content, not all the jumping around. Only two people know something about Plato's rationalism. Oh, I don't like that thing. When, when it's like that, it puts me in a, a bad mood. Eh? I want an engaging class, so we take off quickly. Okay, very good. That is more helpful. Teresa Aka, go ahead, Tess. What did you see in Plato's philosophy that makes it rationalist? Yeah. Keep the hands up, you won't get tired, okay? All the hands that are up, you can keep them up. I'll take you later. Teresa, please go ahead. Yes, it's also read that Plato believes, Plato believes that some of them believes that knowledge is acquired through dependence of experience. And he also believes that he believes in the innate ideas that is knowledge in bond. Yes, so maybe um, which is built in the mind itself as part of our rational nature. So, for example, maybe a mathematical two plus five is equal to seven. So, according to him, we know it is, we know that two plus five is equal to seven. By our, yes, it's because we know it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I'm just taking your feedback so we can polish them up, but it will be pertinent for us all to show that from Plato's so-and-so philosophy, he said so-and-so in his philosophy of this or in his so-and-so, you see that that way that we are really connecting it. We are not saying things we believe he said. Now we are engaging his text. So maybe Plato's theory of forms says that so and so and so, and that one suggests that he subscribes to in it. That that's what we are doing now. Thank you. Let's take Ella Morrison. Israel Opoku, please be on standby. Ella, go ahead. 
I've seen Janet, Hello, I've seen Samuel Tai. Keep the hands up. The class is a very big class. You want me to project for you to see the number of students for main campus alone who have opted to do rationalism. There are so many. So when we come and we are engaging in class, don't make it look like there are only four or three people in the class. All right, my lady, go ahead, Ella. Yeah, please, um, Plato believes that uh, what we experience from our senses does not provide us with any guarantee that what we are experiencing is true. Very good, continue. Yeah. In other um, words, okay, sorry. See, my, my big mouth won't shut up. Go ahead, my lady. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he's trying to say it's it's um it's not reliable because these uh they change they are constantly Very changing good. so Very then good. we cannot rely on it. Yes. Very good. Um, that's all. Very good. That is typically led to just like uh, my lady who set us off also started. This is typically Plato. Plato's argument is that the sciences do not give us stable confidence in what it provides as knowledge. That is why he, Plato, wouldn't even call that knowledge. Because, and Ella tells you what she saw in Plato's text. If we got a specific text, it would be very good. But I've pointed that out already to everyone. Okay, you can see in his so-and-so, in his Republic, or in his so-and-so, uh, uh, that, that's how you do it. Then it, it, it makes, I see. I still see four hands. So I don't want four hands. I want more. <laughs> I want more because everyone passed English and everyone was. I mean, most of you were in class last week, and when we were ending, we all agreed that you are going to engage that content on Plato's philosophy. And these are not anything difficult. You know, I just want to see that people are proactively engaged in the course. Otherwise. You know what's up. So, Madam has added to that. Let's take Isaac. Ask Isaac to be honest. Was Isaac? Yeah, I know Israel Opoku to be on standby. Thank you, Marston. Ella. Israel, go ahead. Then it means I'll be on standby. Hello, Mara. Doc. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Madam, for, um, for Plato, um, he did not argue that knowledge for Plato. Not just the knowledge are in it, but whatever we are knowing in this world is just an attempt to remember what we already know. Very good. That's very important. And the, all these are in the slides. Okay. I, I, I mean, people read around it and enrich it, but they are there. That's how I don't understand why the hands are down. <laughs> or people want to be that about. I'm not going to pamper anybody. I'm word basar. So your friend Israel says, not just that knowledge is in it or inborn. But he even goes further to say, to reinforce that position that you would want to consider that rationalist. What position is that? That to, when we, in this physical world where we are entrapped, the real us is entrapped in this physical container called the body of sensibility, the body that senses, it sees, it hears, it touches, it tastes and smells. In this container where we are restricted, and I say we, the essential you and I, the essential non-physical part of you is what is real. And we, and you can get that in his theory of forms, reality versus appearance. Real things are not physical. They are not tangible. They are not a uh, uh, special temporal and so on. So you have to revise your level 100. If you have thrown the notes away, well, then you find them or you join my 102 class. How do you do that? I have some recordings on that, on the academic channel. Go there and revise. You don't have it, plenty of excuses. This same channel where I put my links there, just find a playlist for PHCL 102 or for PHCL 201 because they do the introductory philosophy especially the 102. That's the first contact students of philosophy have with philosophy. First semester, they do classics, so uh, the civilizations in classics. So it's the 102 philosophical questions that I have taken for some years now. That, and intentionally so, to put students, I believe, 
in a very right frame for the course called philosophy and a better understanding of it. You will find Plato, you find Descartes, you find all those folks there discussed in a class session and then you revise them for your own sake. So Plato's theory of forms, the world of reality versus the world of appearance, which is still the same as the world of essences, the world of ideas, capital I, the world of concepts, capital C, the world of essences. All these different labels represent what Plato calls reality. Then the other one is what? An appearance of the real. And he uses that to show you that the real things are not physical. So if I want to engage the real Israel, Opoku, it is not his physical body. The physical body is not real for Plato. And he gives you reasons why he says that, which Madame Ella and the subsequent sister that spoke, I'm making a note of the names, referenced. What did they say? They said the appearance keeps changing. It is not stable. So when it, you, you get this information, supposed knowledge, supposed because of Plato, that is not knowledge. The next minute, it has changed. The, the building looks square. You, by the time you get closer, it has become rectangular or tri, tra, trapezium or what have you in shape. You thought you, were, you saw a pool of water on the highway. You get closer, it was a mirage. You thought you heard Dr. Miles speak. Oh, doc, doc, doc is coming. So I think that's just, a person comes and it is uh, T.A. Muhammad. Hey, I thought I heard uh, the senses, the sense of uh, hearing, the sense of sight, the sense of touch, the sense of taste do not give us, according to Plato's, how do I put it, version, how Plato thinks of it, doesn't give us Knowledge, because for him, knowledge proper, karate, it's not physical. Knowledge is not physical. So what do we get through the senses are what? Opinions, beliefs. Remember the cave, inside the cave, where uh, I think I gave you some introduction of that last week when I was wrapping up, where one-eyed man, so to speak, in, in figurative, uh, is the boss, is the king because all the other people there will be blind and they see shadows. When I say blind, figuratively, okay? So they think they know the real good, the real, like, oh, this is level 100. We are doing level 300 now. They think they know the real justice, what beauty really is. These are concepts, concepts, ideas. And he says that that is not real. Real, why? Because it changes. It, it is within space and time. So if it is the beautiful sister you see that you think represent what beauty really is, he says you are joking. The sister will become all wrinkled in no time. All that we need to change her face that you are calling beauty is a slap from Johnny Bravo. And you recognize it. Again. So this one that can change, this one that is uh, within space and time, this one that is Tem tempor uh, temporary, that's what I just did, time restricted, and time can change its stitcher. That fine four-wheel drive you saw in the, in the, that you won't allow, even the, let's just take it now. That fine structure, building, hotels, a skyscraper, look at it now, they're all rubble. They, they come, it's not permanent. There is no permanent <laughs> with sensory knowledge. Bernard, Pepper, mute up. Mute up, please. Your background is not good. I don't want to disable your mic. So mute up, Bernard. Uh -huh. Okay. It's not permanent. It's ever changing. What is ever changing? Sensory information. What we call sensory knowledge. But just says it can't be knowledge. If it is knowledge, it must be fixed. Simple. Fixed meaning here, simple, not complex. Complex means one is one gives birth to the other. One it's, it's a, it's various aspects of it. No, if it is knowledge, it's one. So there is only beauty, the concept beauty. And that concept is what a beautiful girl is participating in Plato's language. That beauty is what your beautiful phone 
is participating in. The beautiful car is participating in that one thing called beauty. One. So the concept of beauty is what is real. The idea of beauty. Mm -hmm. However, there can be several particular instances, particular examples of such beautiful things. And those ones can change. Your pen can be broken in no time. That car will become a cake. Uh, it can even burn on the way, God forbid, and it will become ashes. If that is true, then Plato says, that is not what knowledge is. So that's what your friend said. After he talked about real knowledge is already inscribed in what? The real us, the real you. If you want to call it the soul, some want to call it the spirit, some want to call it the intellect, some want, want to call it consciousness, non-physical parts of the human person. The physical can be destroyed. God forbid, a hand can be cut off. People may lose their limbs. Eyes may close. In fact, the very essential you, the soul of spirit, can exit and be totally separated from the physical container called the body. And when that happens, in Plato's term, that is glory, hallelujah, celebration time. That is what we call that. So a real philosopher should be celebrating the 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 sad exit of Achu, our friend. Why? Because his soul is now so free. I say when you hear soul, don't think we have gone to church. That doesn't play to non-physical you. So you can call mind in another language of it. You can say the intellect. You can say spirit. You can say consciousness. But because a word like consciousness, for example, is so hmm, multifaceted and convoluted. You place it when you use the non-physical aspect of uh, the person. That side of actually should feel so free now. Why? Because it doesn't have the obstructions, the restrictions that the physical you and I have. You want to reflect on important things that you feel hungry. Because you eat. This body obstructs our view of what the right thing is. Because you know very well you shouldn't copy. It's wrong. How do I know? You already know, says Plato. No one teaches you that. It is in it. It's part of what makes you you, rational. So the human being who is a rational being already knows concepts like right, wrong, good, bad, just, beautiful, organized society, justice. I, I mentioned that already. You know all that already. What has happened is through the trauma of birth, you've forgotten. So that is the point uh, say Israel just made, that you are only trying to remember. So in this physical world where you are trapped, unlike a brother Achu, who is now liberated from the restriction of the container, is that a liberation? He says, yes. Plato says, yes. And liberated. When you fast, for example, what you are doing is you are beating down the effect that the physical body will have over you. Because sometimes, even when you hear go, I'm talking about the desire and joy with the football. You say go, you can you see, do you see what happened with, <laughs> with our speaker? Ghana speaker uh, of parliament. When Ghana scored recently, yeah, you can jump and dance. Everybody was excited. You can jump and there's no control. You're so happy. Talk about when you are so hungry, your eyes sees food, the type you like, adorned and set on the table and it's not yours. You know it's wrong to take that which is not yours, but your stomach is hungry and your eyes has seen. The brother, when the brother touches, I do a uh, back 
and wraps it and say, oh, I draw, I draw, and then I draw a bit, oh, black coffee, black coffee stuff. I don't like that. Black coffee, and she's doing all those things. It is the sense of touch that is going to make her go looking for what she shouldn't go looking for. That will make her go looking for what she shouldn't be looking for. Kakanu, I just disabled your mic. You were distracting us with the noise at the background. Keep your microphones muted when I mute you, okay, please. Because sometimes you don't do it intentionally, but it, it, it obstructs what you are doing. So keep it muted. I already issued a disclaimer. I don't have to, because it's a class session. Tell your friends who are not online, I will open assessment right now that you will do on Sakai. It's a big class. I don't want so many of you losing marks like that. But you shouldn't sit at home in the name of it's online. So what, what when, when we are having an online session, is that not an advantage for you? So that if you have to even save some, some transport or you have to, you just do that. Now you won't attend a lecture. I, I see attendees are 113, even that you can't tell who is where. So I'll open an assessment short, tell them so that they don't lose the mark. Yo. So that is what our friend says. As soon as the soul is separated from the body, you are better able to see the real thing because the, in, the corruption of the senses are no longer there. You will see them that sometimes in our movies, when the person dies, the person now knows who did what, who was who caused his or her death, for example, we, we are told they would chase the person uh, to whatever. It's just capturing that thought that there is no limitation. If you are making a note, you can be writing that down. Now there is no limit to you. And take note to what uninterrupted absolute knowledge of what reality, uninterrupted. In the physical world where you are restricted by the container, once in a while you can take glimpses of the reality. How? When you tame your physical body a little, so you don't look, you are not listening, so you get angry and abash it. I am not, you know, the brother would just take off his shirt and he's fighting on the street because he heard something. It's the senses. What if I, I can't hear? Or I don't hear at all. Then that that corruption. That will make me do what I know is wrong or what I shouldn't do. It won't come in. I was talking about Sister Adua, that someone is rubbing her back and she's doing the enjoyment and enjoyment. If the person's touch, she couldn't feel like a dead body. How, how many times will you slap a dead body for it to say, Adi, no. Or will you, uh, you are... This is an adult class. Will you go and smooch a dead body's back and then say, ah, I like it going. Huh? No. <laughs> the, the thing that keeps the body active is no longer there. So the body's corruption cannot mar or make the soul dirty. This is the point. And that is why death or let me say it in a way that you can accommodate separation, separating the physical from the non-physical in Plato's tent is a day of celebration. Oh, happy day. Which days are the day of death? This is the time that the, the soul attains absolute uninterrupted and what? Stable knowledge of reality. So we have seen recollection, we have seen Absolute knowledge is attainable only without the interference of the senses. We have seen that the senses do not give us, you know, fixed, uh, uh, you know, I want to use a, an expression that was in the text, yeah, a fixed reality that is not fluctuating. Today, uh, you think you have seen a pool of water, you go closer, it's not, you have seen, see, see get closer it's not a pool of water after all that's fluctuating the next day it was a, a pool of water you know it, it is not stable senses don't give you i said the same yogurt that you loved so much as soon as you get malaria you don't want to even eat it again it's not it's not sweet that is how it is buy a new suit shirt and suit i mean 
new one. Don't touch it. Don't do anything with it. So just hang it in a wardrobe and leave it uh, for 30 years or something. 30 years may even be too long. Go and see what will happen. Don't touch it. Don't do it. It's just hang it there by itself. It will get destroyed by itself. Because as soon as the thing is physical, given to us in sensation, it will change. It is destructible, etc. etc. If all these are true of Plato, I think I've said a lot of it, and I'll allow others to speak just in case what they wanted to say, eh, to say hasn't been said. If all these are true, then these are strong, strong, strong reasons why it will make sense to call him rational. So we, we already see in its concept thesis a central to him. Then there is in it knowledge thesis also, as well. To an extent, for he believes every day must every event must have a cause, every soul and so on. If you believe he believes that you already knew prior to existence, it's just a trauma of birth that has made you forgotten. So on earth, you are recollecting either because you have intentionally suppressed the senses and its impact through maybe spiritual exercise, you are meditating, or you are uh, intentionally close your doors this week. I'm not going out. I'm not fasting or anything. But I don't want to see evil, hear evil, touch evil, taste evil, or what have you, because you know the conception of evil. But it is so bled that sometimes even what is not uh, what is evil is seen as not evil. So you see, I'm not going out. I can use that to suppress the senses. And it's not even because I'm fasting or anything. I just stay away of, from the corruption that the senses puts in my sister. That's one way. Or sometimes I'm walking around the physical world and then I encounter a fresh babe, so beautiful. And her closeness, she's an instance of it. She's a photocopy of the reality, yes. But her closeness to that reality, if we were climbing out of the cave, some are deep, deep down illusion, some, some, some down their belief, yeah? in that order, before you get to uh, cl start climbing out. And then when you're closer towards out of the cave, the symbolism Plato used is what I'm doing. The sun ray from the top there throws its light. And so even though you are not yet out to encounter real knowledge, you are a bit closer to it. So some people are very close to justice, some social systems are very close to the conception of justice, that what justice should really be, the what should justice really be, a just society should be what? You, as you reflect and think through, you come to a closer view of what justice is, and then the society will run with that. Philosopher Keynes will do that work and then say that, you know, just system shouldn't be a system that is treating everybody equally, just like that, just equal treatment. No, that, that is not what justice should mean because it's possible that there could be emergencies at the hospital there. So you were first in the queue, but we may have to attend to the emergency that came and therefore we will have to treat you differently. So even though you came first, we will say the one who came the ninth, in the queue should rather be treated first. And that is not equal treatment. We, we could give some people, it's, uh, you know, uh, you're all in the traffic and the traffic jam is crazy. Everybody wants to make it to wherever they are going to their destination. And yet, if the uh, medical, who, which example, I don't want the MP1 because sometimes that one is not too many, but maybe the, the only, uh, uh, um, heart surgeon, maybe we have only three heart surgeons at Kolibu, for example, and there is an emergency at the hospital there. The heart surgeon is moving from one hospital after a surgery to the other. And you can't say you should be in the queue like that. That will not be equal treatment. We will have to escort him and then they say give way. And then the heart surgeon will be they, they give way for him to come and pass because he's going to save a life. When you two, you are coming to teach or you are going to buy gobe and you are very hungry in the turtle. But your turtle will be in the queue for 30 minutes and the man will come and pass in three seconds and he's gone, escorted by police. That is not equal treatment, but perhaps it is fair because a heart dying somewhere, it's not like your gobe, that you can do soakings, but you say you're the gobe, nah, it's what you want, I want you want the baby one, 
on the campus where we are going there. Just example to show you, sir. So here, we will be treating you so seemingly unequally, and yet it is fair. I'm sure I would have said this earlier in our discussions, that this will be fair. Who is doing this reflection and thinking through and suggestions to make better interpretations, better understandings of what the concept say justice should be? The reflector, the one who reflects a philosophical mind, says Plato. That's why he, he advocated for a philosopher king kind of, kind of a rule. Because if you are going to pursue development for people, you should be the, a person who can conceptualize about development. You can reflect and know it and see what its intricacies are, what its big umbrella would include, blah, blah, blah. And then you can pursue it. Other factors, health concerns. You cannot be pursuing something you don't know. That's the import of Plato's famous claim that until philosopher King's rule, there will be no peace. Because you are going to pursue peace. The one who reflect, not the one who is looking and gathering data about how peace is, has been defined in our everyday life all the time. Because that is what the senses gives you. And in the cave there, those are the bosses that are determined, this is what beauty is. This and, and yet, if you reflect, so you see how many times I've talked about reflection? Reflection is not done with the senses. It is a, an intellectual activity. And when I say intellectual, don't only think brain. It is a soulish thing, non-physical, so a spiritual thing for someone. A, a, no, a meditations, a reflection, intellect. Whichever label you want to give it, it is non-physical. It's not something you go and see. And I think I told, I don't know if it was this class, because I'm teaching things that overlap a little in terms of uh, subject matter. But the depth is different for the different levels I'm teaching, even level 400. Too. So sometimes the examples overlap. Now, I'm saying that those who like to create, like an artist, not a physical artist as in drawing alone, but one who creates music, or one who creates even fashion, they like to, sometimes they like to be away for a while. They like the mountainous, very quiet, not this busy industry, boo, boo, smoke, and boo, 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 of, that's what sabbaticals are for. Go and have a rest away from everything and then you reflect. And you see that it gets to a time, you see that you are, you are like sailing and then the ideas just keep coming because you are able to think without too many obstructions. All these things I'm saying are what? Plato. I'm not going to church. I'm not meditating. I'm not talking, excuse me, talking about chanting. I'm talking Plato. And so if these are uh, net bits in his philosophies that you can clearly outline, then you have good reason to think of him as a rationalist. Any questions or any additions? So let me see the hands that are still up. If there's something else that we could have added. I see Rahel Wusu's hand just popped up. I'll take it. Jonathan's hand is still up. Janet's hand is up some more time. And then Kakenu. If Kakenu, if your hand is up, uh, where is it? Okay. Then you can ask your question. Kakenu. If Kakenu is not able to spend some more time, you are able to. Hello, Doc. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Doc, okay, the little I want to add up is uh, making some references from our previous lectures on the rationalism. Yeah. We learned that the rational gives room for reason, being the chief source of knowledge, proud experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Plato also comes in and says, yes, as a rationalist as he is, he also agreed that. That knowledge is a product to experience. But mm. in one way or the other, our experiences also 
trigger certain kind of knowledge that you already have without hey. having ex experienced it at that time. But it, 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 it is it's a sign of causing it for us to remember it. So for instance, uh, using that statement that no one teaches uh, a child who God is. So for instance, if a child is in, in the church and they say that God is good all the time, yet the child already knows that there is something or someone called God. But when mm -hmm. that statement is being made, it, it, it draws the attention uh, the child attention to that there is someone somewhere called God. So mm -hmm. the person was the child was already having some some kind of knowledge about God, but mm -hmm. it's, it's due to wow. uh, that thing that was said in the church. That's what brought his attention that God is exactly. So that's the exactly. that I would like. It's yeah. big. It's not little. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. It's very big. So Plato makes room for century, but he will not call it knowledge the impact, or if you like better still, the trigger that the senses make to help us remember, then that's Israel's own, recollect, knowledge as recollection, to help us recollect what we already know, especially when it comes to concepts, certain concepts, you know that it can't always be everything that you know, like the hair do you do seven years from today, I mean, you know, you may you may know it, but it's it forgotten. But it's not as trivializing the matter as that. But when it comes to morality, ethics, metaphysics, or metaphysical concept, causality, freedom, those ones, then our friend has buttressed the point to say that when I see the way I put a seed in the soil and it grew, then it makes me remember that Cause, cause and effect act that way, okay? So the one about God, the concept of God, the one about justice, the one about fairness, the one about beauty. I mean, a good society, what is a good society? A society that takes care of its elderly, not make pensioners go stand at a place so distraught. If no matter what, even if it is the thing they don't understand if you we want to and that's not the case anyway but suppose they don't even understand the whole thing about the plenty mathematics they are the elderly someone to walk to them and patiently work them give them some refreshment at Kempiski, a massage be give them some music let them play some music for them and tell them please all that you are at so it's exactly what we are doing for you please relax cry the way you came to sit cry we are hey, do some manicure for grandma massage you take care of your, your, your elderly. And you in Shirao. So when you are watching that, a uh, friend that just spoke says, if that is being done, it reminds you, when you see how the, that society has a welfare system, take care of you, say, ah, I re it makes me remember. And that is when you say, this is good. That this is good, you are saying, you're only recollecting what you already knew except that because of the evil all around sometimes, you forget. But if you see one good act given to the poor, one good act stopping the one who is bearing, uh, bearing false witness, one good act avoiding gossip, you say, ah, this is my friend there, she's so good. Looking out for a friend. You see, that good act, says your friend, helps you remember and so two ways either you do reflection that one you haven't seen an object that is good you haven't seen an object that is beautiful to help you remember no but by your own reflection you ponder you ask questions should this be what piety is should this be holiness ah, should this be what family is you are on your own thinking too. How can we say we have family and we treat ourselves this way? You are reflecting, shouldn't a family do this and that and that? As you are doing that, you will get a clearer view because you are trying to remember. So you are, it's like digging and digging and digging, climbing out and out of the world of stomach politicians. In <laughs> a, a, a burger, eh? The world of a burger. In climbing out and out 
through the intellect and the depth of intellectual work rises to level 100. It's not the same as 200. Okay, the enlightenment, the light thrown at you. It's not the same. The viewpoint, it can be a new birth in Christ. The, the new child in Christ, for example. Hmm? A lot of things are allowed. The person will be doing so many, but when you rise, you see that there are certain things in fatal. It is not befitting of you. You have to mature intellectually. That's intellectual I'm talking about would be spiritually. You are deep. Paul says, I can't give you meat because you are still toddlers. These are all rationalist intonation, if you ask me, because the person is speaking about not physical food. He's talking about you don't have depth in understanding certain concepts. He says, there are things I can't tell you. If I tell you, you understand. It's better, it's better for you, sorry, that I go so that the helper will come. All talking about depth, how deep you are in understanding. These are not physical matters. Okay, so you can be level 400. And even though 400 is better than 100, 400 is not the same as PhD. Don't joke about it. So that PhD person too may have certain may. I said may because some of the labels are just populist. It doesn't have the weight that it presumes it has. So we don't arrogate to ourselves anything just because you have titles. It has to count. The title must show that is what is important as a philosophical mind. So we look out for what the title is doing, not that I have the title. So what? You don't even have to say it to show. So I'm saying that the PhD person's depth, and I'm just using academia to make the point. I've used some, some spirituality. The chief imam's depth of Islamic knowledge cannot be the same as the fresh person. So I just use that to show you the degrees. And you see that in Plato's epistemology, the depth. So opinion, illusion, what have you, are all within beliefs. They're all within the empirical, but some are better than others, even within the empirical range. And then you see that we rise out. And then finally, when you get out of the cave, where the ultimate reality, the ultimate essence, the ultimate good, if you're talking spiritual language, a religion, you say where the ultimate source of all spirit, God, throws his light on all beings. So you can see the real things. Remember, we say in religion that the world and everything is, is, is not real. It's passing away. The real things are non-physical. That is what we are saying. So from speaking typically philosophy to giving a counterpart in what? Religion or faith, you will see that we are virtually speaking rationalism and we are speaking the intellect, and we are speaking, even though intellectual, the physical, the empirical sources trigger it. So the trigger can help you encounter, or re not encounter, remember the reality, which is already there. And that is the addition that Boss made, very important addition. Very good. Do we have any other? Rahel Usu, is it Rahel? Rachel, also, go ahead. My, my lady, your hand is up, so go ahead, unless you are sorted. So Plato's rationalism, I've said everything. Look at my screen now. Yes, my lady, go ahead. I like that, Papa. Why you yes, call me like that? Yeah. My father shakes in his grave <laughs> like that. Go ahead, please. <laughs> yes, please, I'm Rachel. Yes. Please, no. I, I want you to ask a question. Uh -huh. A question concerning Plato, um, what he said about um, being separated from the body, and that's how we can know more things, and there are no more limits in to knowing certain things. Is it the same? I'm so sorry, but that knowledge okay. is uninterrupted, absolute, no fluctuation kind of what knowledge about. There we go. So when there is no obstruction from the body, 
you are able to really know the absolute perfect triangle, for example, absolute perfect beauty, for example. That is the point. So it's that at that time, there is no connection of the soul with the body because the body comes with its baggage of a blurred vision of the real. You want to pray, then the, the sister's hips and her chest, you know, you, ooh, yeah, you are trying, but it's no you get the I can see the thing has anointed oil on it and she has rubbed it and tight. So you want to be part that money behind the tada by you are but since so I too this year, but didn't know before I would <laughs> so brother, brother will feel a little and say, Quay! church, you know, you want to pray, but the, the lecturer has released I and you just got a prompt on your phone from the email circular. So you, you see that you get a little distracted. But if you didn't see, it won't obstruct your climbing out of the cave, your meditation. Okay, now continue with your question because I got you up. Yes. Please, is it the same as um, when you dream? Because some people say when they dream, they know certain things. Okay. Plato would not consider dreaming per se. Because it will depend on how you conceptualize a dream. Do you think a dream is an activity of your senses or dream? When I say senses, you are at level 300 and you are philosophers. So you understand that senses means seeing, sight, hearing, touch, tasting, smelling. Is it, is it those five channels that are are dreaming or you think a dream is an intellectual thing because then it will determine whether Plato will consider the dream state as what uh, an intellectual state. Something dreaming is a physiological thing, it's physical. If you eat plenty, then your reflexes give you that impression. And so they can give a physicalist interpretation of how it is that you are dreaming. But the asan I can Philosophy, for example, according to Kwame Jechi, when he, he gives a rendition of Akan philosophy, we are doing that in level 200. We did it some two weeks or so ago. He believes that the spiritual part, which is really intertwined with the Okra, that spirit, Sunsum, or no, so that Sunsum is non physical or better still, immaterial, it's not a material substance. And therefore, we can place it in somewhat the context that played to that. That one, then it will mean that the dream state, that which is dreaming, is the non-physical you. And therefore, it will be better able to view reality. Better is a relational matter. It will be better than if you were using your physical body that is located with, within space and time and can't know the reality of it. Look at this man that has been arrested in the name of being the one who possibly, possibly, I said, uh, killed our former MP years ago. He is still at, at the prison there because we cannot be certain. We cannot know for certain whether he did or he didn't. And so we are still investigating. Look at how long it's, it's kept. But if we were to deal with the, the one, the aspect of us that doesn't have limitations, we will know. <laughs> we will know. That's a, the presumption. Okay, so that is the answer to the question. If you think of dreams as emanating from the non-physical, the immaterial part of a human person, then it can it can have a better view of reality than than the physical body world, and therefore it can be cl more closer to real uh, knowledge than the other one. However, for Plato. So far as there isn't a total disconnect of the non-physical from the physical, attaining an absolute uninterrupted true knowledge about reality is, is, is not possible. Because even if you got the view of it, because you are back into the container, this prison cage of a body, you will get, you know, distracted again. Not only is it corrupting you, it distracts you. 
like I told you, you want to make sure that this case you are going to sit on as a judge, you want to make sure that you administer justice, ensure that the wrong person who did the wrong thing is punished, and the one who has been wrongly dealt with receives uh, you know, compensation or, I mean, he or she is sorted. So you want a clarity of it. But by the time you go home, like the scenarios that we saw, then they, 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 there's a good that is after you. If you're not careful, it can obstruct. It doesn't necessarily mean it will change what you are going to say, but it can blur your view about oh, maybe this man too. It was because of the natural. It we ask children, Ubwa is the good. Is the good, especially the good, the one that has sent in that pumping, the scent in the soup that you are going to enjoy this afternoon can make you say, okay, the thing should have been 12 years, but we can we can still punish him. Say there are three years to we are still gone to. And Plato says, What if you didn't feel hungry? Or you won't even smell this, the goat meat, and make it worry you so much that you want to look good. That is the point. So until there is a total disconnect, you can do a good job, reflect, meditate, if you want to talk spiritual language, go for fasting, you know, waiting, if you want to speak charismatic, you know, <laughs> meditation. You do all that. And then just when you are descending from the mountain, you will see the sister, like I told you, or you see the brother having plenty cash. He has gone to do, I don't know the name you give it now, but in the past, we, we had words like Sakawa. And he has so much that he, he picks it and throws it at the funeral ground. And everybody's saying, we koto, we koto, we yoga, we yoga. And you too, you have come to, you have know, done rationalism. And you are waiting for them to finish. So you ask your uncle for transport back to Accra. So your seeing of it, Charlie, you sit and say, this good thing that I'm wasting time, cry. is it worth the while? Maybe in the long run, reason will prevail. See another word I've mentioned, reason, intellect. So maybe reason will prevail, but it, the, the obstructions can, can be many. That what you saw can distract you. There's a sister that may be struggling with her relationship or, uh, you know, marriage. There can be a guy that is struggling with marriage or relationship because he cannot bear the size of the woman's tummy now after one delivery. What if he, he didn't see? So you know very well that you shouldn't do the other thing that you are doing with that cheap girl, you see, for example. You know you shouldn't. <laughs> Plato says, you know already, it's not someone that has to even tell you. What a person will be doing is reminding you of what you already know. We have gone through that right now. But you, you can also see the, the stomach too. It has become a, too extended. And it, you are not pleased with it. So until, I said that finally, until there is a total disconnect. If it is a dream, you wake up and come back into the body. And the body's trouble. All the various instances are living will come up again to come and disturb, if you like, and distract what you thought you knew. But if it is a total cutoff, then oh, what did, did you hear Paul say that? For me, Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He was speaking something that we can relate with Plato. When I die, I've gained. Why again? Because now I don't have any trouble. They know uh, uh, you have gone to preach here, you shouldn't have preached. I have an in, uh, un, un, unlimited freedom to know. And for Platonic or Plato's philosophy, that ability or desire to know is an ultimate good. When you attain knowledge, you have reached it. The height. That's why he pursued that with his academy and everything. So that is really the ultimate. Death is that end that a true philosopher pursues. And so don't go and look for a knife and cut your head and say, you're going to be a true philosopher. It can mean that a constant depreciation of the self, and here I'm speaking Bible, the constant, you know, taunting of the physical 
the empirical, the things that come to the senses, when you continually reduce that one and rely, uh, rely and relate more with what reason, intellect, non-physical, spiritual, you want to get to the mind of the guy than his shoe and the colors of the shoe and the belt that he came to propose to you with. Maybe those are not too you know, chic and classy, but they can be changed, they're accidental. But a person speaks in a certain way, you see the kind of depth and the way he's, he, he thinks of building family and the sense of care and those ones transcend. They are, they are perhaps things that will go further, further with you if you were to engage a relationship. With a little polish here and there, see, please change this your trousers tomorrow when you are coming, don't wear this. My mother will laugh at you. Stuff like that. With that, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, he would come out to be a better person than when you are all dependent on what was the car that came? <laughs> what was the car? Was it there? this? Hey, shh. It didn't say yes. This one, they said yes to the proposal. Then you enter and then the car is for the boss that has traveled. And he's just sweeping and cleaning the house. Now the car is there. The essence is lost. So those are the practical, if you like, relatable examples I can give to you on Plato and how he thinks of what is really there. This is what appears to be there. I, I hope the elaboration helped. Yes, please. Very good. So everything we've said is what we have put in an outline uh, in slides for you. You will see that when I walk you through it, there isn't much addition done for you to now be ready to write bluffo. Bluffo, pa, 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 when I ask you, you put your eye in your final exam, which I believe you will do. But we still have one in class uh, assessment to do. This is the sixth week. So we'll do our IA and then possibly one uh, either group work or something before the final, then you are so done. Some points of clarification on your screen, please, respectfully. Demonstrating features of Plato's philosophy that makes him rationalist. And I keep reminding you, rationalist as an epistemological theory about the basis of knowledge, not rationalist as being uh, adopting you know, certain uh, academic posture to work. For that one, both All right, I'm back. I had to recharge. I think my data ran out, so I had to recharge, but I'm back. And so we can quickly continue. Please, can you hear me? 
Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. All right, so we continue from there. I was just elaborating yes. on point two. So quickly, I, I reached my slide. Yeah. So this is where I got to. I said that when you hear rationalists, there are two ways of thinking of that word. The general sense, the generic. When we say, oh, be rational about that. I've said that uh, most of the things I say, I'm almost always repeating them for emphasis. And then for you to now come to terms with it. Ah, that's what you meant. Oh, I've, he I've heard you say that often. Uh, ah, that is the point. Okay. So I've said this over and over again. General use of the word rational. When you talk of, ah, this is young girl, you want her to carry two buckets of water. Ah, it should be rational. That would be rational use of that word rational there. And when you said be rational about that, you didn't mean be uh, the opposite of empiricism. We're not talking epistemology. We're speaking rational, the word rational in the generic sense of it, where both empiricists and rationalists adopt that method. Okay, whereas we can talk of rational, rationalism in the strict or technical sense of the term. So someone read what is on your screen for me. I want a name that will make remembering easy for your cells. Tabitha, please read. Thank you. Janet, thank you. I see uh, Mabel, Mabel, Mabel I see hand also up, and then Justifa. Oh, very good. Tabitha, go ahead. The general sense of the term rational simply means reasoning, reflecting, criticizing, examining an issue, etc before arriving yeah. at a conclusion. In this sense of the term, both empiricists and the strict rationalists adopt a rational approach to philosophical study. To a philosophical study. So when we use the word rational in the generic sense of it, that's generally how you, we, to mean what? Reflecting, criticizing, examining an issue. When we say philosophy, it's a rational activity. A question asking enterprise, a rational activity. We want to say that it is an, an activity that engages the mind and its reflection and its reasoning and examines issue and criticizes, evaluates, judges, you know, that's what we mean. And for that, even the empiricists would have to adopt a rational approach to doing philosophy, asking philosophy, uh, pertinent questions, interrogating matters, all fall into the range of the word rational when used generically, in the generic sense, general, okay? But we can have this also. Tabitha. Clarification two. The rationalist believes that at least some knowledge or truth about actual existence occurs non-linguistic, non-analytic, is acquired through reason independently of sense experience. Very good. This is very important. And I want you to take particular attention to it. The contention between rationalists and empiricists, as we have discussed, is not really about linguistic or if you like analytic truth, redundancies, tautologies. Even the empiricist who is strictly arguing that every knowledge is sourced ultimately from sense experience, mm, empiricist, even that person admits that you cannot say a bachelor has beaten his wife mercilessly. And that when I tell you, oh, but you, but how can this be? You say, you come and see the girl's face. He doesn't need to come and see, even though he says ultimate knowledge is always sourced from experience. The, the empiricist knows that there can be analytic truth. There can be what? Uh, what's the other one? Linguistic truth that do not depend on experience in how you know it. And yet, ultimately, it is sourced from experience. So their contention is not about redundant truth. Redundancies means truths that are necessarily the case. 
by the language of it. You, are, you can tell by looking at the language. Then they don't need to go and observe, even as empiricists. What then is the contention about? They are contending about how we source knowledge or truth about what? Actual existence of something. So we are going to open it out slowly. A little technical, but follow slide by slide. I believe you looked at the slides before coming. So as we build on it and open them a bit more, you get it and you, are, you get it well so much so that you can also impart through others and even be able to critique well. What are you contending over? Madam read it. She said, a rationalist believes that at least some, because of the various versions we have studied, now you see why we see at least some, some knowledge. Because some may say all knowledge. Another may say, oh, not, no, or not all knowledge. We are all rationalists, but I don't think it's all knowledge that we acquire, say, innately, or all knowledge that we acquire in, by intuition it actually no. So you just say at least, and it covers everyone who believes in that view, regardless of the particular variation. So what do they say? This technical sense of the word rationalist, not the generic sense that references the word to mean critical evaluation, examination that we saw earlier. This one says it describes a person who believes that at least some knowledge or truth about actual existence, not linguistic truth, not analytic truth. That's why I said non-linguistic and non-analytic. Okay, They believe that such actual existence is acquired. So a knowledge about the existence of something, we can get that knowledge through reason without the help, or better still, independently of sense experience. So the thing is about experience, but we get it outside of experience, outside of meaning that without the five senses, without using experience. The thing is knowledge about experience, yet we are quite independently of experience. There are people who believe that, and if you have that kind of knowledge, or that kind of view we will label you as a kind of rationalist. That's what we've been doing all this while. So and a knowledge truth about the actual existence of the thing, not a linguistic redundancy like God exists. It's an existential statement. You are making a statement of existence. And we will see in a minute how you differentiate that from what a logical redundancy or and uh, uh, certainties or necessary truth, you will see that if it is a matter of necessity, a necessary truth, even the empiricist will accept it to be true without going to observe. So that is not what is in contention between empiricist and rest. What then is in contention? Whether there can be knowledge of actual existence of something, yet we got that knowledge without experience. So the knowledge is about experience, yet acquired independently of sense experience. And rationalists say, yes. Let me read this one too, then I'll find someone else to continue. Okay. okay. That should be on standby. That means even the staunchest rationalist admits that sense experience plays a role in the acquisition of knowledge. What role would depend on the specific author? Very good. We have established that with our friend's intervention. So we move on quickly to clarification three. Lady Obin, please go ahead. Thank you, Tabitha. Oh, Auntie. Clarification. Clarification okay. three. Yes, ma'am. Not that the rationalist claims that at least some truths about egoistic truths are known independently of experience. Mm -hmm. The preceding statement is what empiricists very disagree with. 
the empiricist position is that truth about experience that is not analytic or non linguistic, like all other truths, can be sourced from experience and only be sourced from experience. Very important argument now. For you to come and say, as a rationalist, you come and say that there can be certain truths about experience. These truths are therefore what we mean when we say non-linguistic truths. They're not language-based, so that you use just the language of it to say that, oh, but this is necessarily false, or this is necessarily true. That one is not in contention. I've said that already. Both rationalists and empiricists will admit that linguistic truths are either necessarily true or necessarily false. So we can have contradictions or tautologies. That one doesn't depend on observation. It is the language of it. So we call them linguistic truth or further still uh, analytic truth. When you go to level 400 and beyond, I think, depending on which, uh, you know, course we are doing, you see that you can interrogate analyticity, whether it is necessarily, uh, you know, uh, linguistic or non-linguistic. The contentions are there. The course is philosophy. So you see that there will be various versions. But at least you can't deny that when we say analytic, it means that it's based on an analysis of the words, the logical structure, the meanings, the definitions of terms. Okay, So these don't have to be observation-based. But that doesn't mean it is no longer empirical for some people. It can be observation based, uh, excuse me, it can be non observation based. Yet, if the ideas that were formulated ultimately originated from the senses, that still can make the empiricist hold his position as an empiricist and yet accept linguistic truths. Linguistic truths don't depend on observation. I said, if I tell you that a bachelor has beaten his wife, that is false already. Don't say that me, that I'm an empiricist. I have to see the bachelor. Who, who you say has beaten his wife before I can say that is false. You lie. If the, the, the person who has beaten his wife is a bachelor, then he cannot beat his wife if you need to. That is necessarily false if you say that bachelor has beaten his wife. Okay. So just to give, just to give. I'm, I'm muting you for a while. I'm getting the feedback. When you are ready to read, then, then you unmute. Now, if that is correct, then what is the empiricist issue? He says, how can you tell me, as for the linguistic ones, we can agree that what? They are known, watch. I'm talking about how we know it, not their nature, what they are. We know it without having to go and observe. We don't have to go to Ngwa, where you say the ambassador is beating his wife to go and observe them. Without going to Mungwa, we already know, even as empiricists, that as for a bachelor, he cannot beat his wife. That is false. If the person is a bachelor, he cannot beat his wife. He said, but you are empiricists. You come and observe, Keke. And no, I don't want to observe. <laughs> I don't have to observe. Because this is not an observation matter. OK, so it's not in contention when it comes to linguistic truth they may not have to depend on the experience. So then what are they pulling hairs over? The issue is with for you, the rationalist, to come and say that this one I'm talking about is not a linguistic truth or a logical redundancy, no, or a definition. I'm talking about an existential claim. See that I'm repeating the same thing again. I want people to understand. I'm talking about a truth about existence, actual experience. So an existential statement, a statement making a claim of existence. Eh? Yet I know that claim of existence independently or prior to existence. Experience, I'm sorry, prior to experience. That one, the empiricist says, na lie. What you claim to be experiential truth, and with it, every other truth, ultimately, ultimately sourced. Look at the word, the source of it from experience. So I will not follow you to go and look 
to determine whether a bachelor has beaten his wife is true or false. I won't follow you. But that would not make me any less an empiricist. Because I didn't follow you, I just admitted by looking at the language of it and said, this is already false. Don't tell me, you see, you support my rationalism. He says, I can, so there we go, I can agree to the logic, logical deductions, mathematical laws. Two plus three equals five. Don't tell me, come and count and see. If it is true or not, you have to see it. I don't have to see. I may be visually impaired, but I can understand that two and three are, is equal to five. It's meanings. So I don't have to see. Okay, that means you can have, I'm, try, I'm trying to show you an overlap. And the reason why you want to be careful to think that if I'm rationalist, it necessarily means I will not accept, uh, if I'm empiricist, we won't share anything in common with the rationalist. I told you, you can have Christians that do my rafi. They put on the hijab, got the hijab, yeah. They wear the, the cover thing on their head. There are Christians that go into their auditorium or their temples without their without their slippers they remove it outside and go inside it there are christians that don't eat pork a version of christianity all these are supposedly typically uh, islam or islamic the overlap is what i'm showing because i use christian muslim to show rationalism and racism just for understanding and easy referencing and for analogy and comparisons here and there we've done that for a while now Okay, so here are instances where people can accept deductive truth. And if it is a truth that is deductive, you are the people that may be doing deductive logic. You know that it is not a matter of observation, it's topic neutral. Up is abyss. This thing is an A, it has to be a B. Modus ponens. You are doing your axiomatization and then you put your predicate logic here, and all these are not dealing directly with what? Content, they are dealing with form. So it is the language of it. So you can have an empiricist. And if you think empiricist means, I say I have foresee before I go believe. If I no see, I go, I no go believe. You, you don't have a deeper understanding of empiricism and rationalism contention. What the empiricist is saying, what the rationalist is saying borders on what? The ultimate source, where did the starting point, the origin of that idea come from? Empiricists say all ideas are sourced from experience. Rationalists say a lie, depending on which version of rationalists you are looking at, whether King James or <laughs> the New Living Translation. The one we see every knowledge comes from mind independently present. Another one say, no, 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 every day is too sharp. I think that it is this particular type and this particular. The other person say, no, 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 it's not just about this. So these people to bring knowledge, just that I want to, when it comes to, uh -huh. so they are contending over the ultimate source of, especially what knowledge about experience yet known independently of experience. Not just knowledge about experience, but knowledge about experience that you claim you got to know it independently of experience. You got to know it without experience. And Yakwenu, I think we are having feedback from your unmuted mic. It's muted. I don't want to disable it. You may have a question. So mute it yourself so that the, the requirements at the background. All right. Thank you. Now, with that said, I can move on to the next slide and ask uh, Adam was reading. Let's ask Magda. No, it was um, forgotten who was reading because the person's hand is down. I always get to the Obin. Obin wa. Ah, I said Miss Obin. So Obin wa quatting. Mate, lady quatting then. Please continue for me. I thought that it was. Um, so on the certainty of linguistic or non-informative truth, please read for me. Uh, and I read. Most I can't hear you. Most 
if you have an earpiece on, I think you should take it off. You are far away. Mm -hmm. Most rationalists exactly. and imperialists exactly. may not disagree that linguistic truths, that is analytic definition, non-informative statements, logical, are absolutely universally or necessarily true by meanings or definitions or logical structure. Mm -hmm. Even the strictest empiricist accepts that we may not need to observe to certain to ascertain the truth of such analytic or logical truths, but they insist that it is ultimately sourced from experience. There is nothing in the mind that was not fed in the senses. The Take senses note of that. The mind before the mind connected them to arrive at the logical truth. Take note of those statements. It will help you one day, just in case you launch into the empiricism frame. You can not know anything except it is gained through um, the empirical source. Okay, says the empiricist. Nothing can be known. Nothing can be in the mind that was not first in the senses. You will see it from uh, Aquinas. I'm, I've gotten a little distracted because of something I've seen on that you. <laughs> it's a bit uh, okay. Let's continue. Uh, you will get it from Aquinas. You see it from Aristotle. You see it from others like that in the empiricist frame, John Locke, uh, uh, David Hume, uh, the, the, the third one, the British empiricist, you see them, Locke, Hume, um, it should be the third one, oh dear. Ben. Russell, Russell, thank you. Bishop Beckley, Locke and Hume, they are the three. Russell's, Russell's um, empiricism, We've got the three British empiricists are the three I just mentioned. Okay, so David Hume, John Locke, Bishop George Barclay. All right, thank you, Madam. So the point I wanted to make there was to tell you that it is ultimately sourced from experience. That's the insistence of the empiricists. They insist that it was ultimately sourced from experience. Great examples of linguistics. A linguistic or non informative truths. Sister, let me see. I think I have someone oh, else in the class now. Edward, thank you. Uh, other hands up. Thank you so much. Let's take Mabel Lassie now. Uh, Magdalene will be on standby. Someone, I've seen your hand for a while now. Eh? Let it be there. I'll call you. Let's take Mabel Lassie. Mabel, go on. Examples of linguistic or non Non-informative truth. Non -informative yeah. truth. Um, all by Just a minute, my lady. Just a minute. So either someone is a your colleague is with you. They're having feedback. It won't help your recording. So you you want to mute that or you listen to yourself in the laptop, not on the. I don't know. One thing should go off there. Okay. Is it gone? Yes, please. Very good. Quite yes. good. Thank you. Hey, you are making all me look dogs. like a, a radio station, Madame Bissar. <laughs> but uh, all dogs back. I then to ask for next one. Examples of linguistic or non-informative truth. Mm -hmm. All backing dogs back. The triangle good. has this. A mm -hmm. A. I won't these comment from true. the class now. Yeah, but uh, for the three expressions on the what makes them linguistic or non-informative truth? Someone comment on that because I've done all the talking so far. Can someone say why why is all back end dogs back a, a, a non-informative linguistic truth? Francis Aite, you want to try your hands on that? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, please. The information is already contained in the statement. It does not communicate anything new to us. Ah, 
well done. It's not saying anything new, Amabella. It's like development is development. We are, uh, that's that's the format. It's, you are telling her that the thing is a dog can, a, a dog can, a barking dog. <laughs> if it is a barking dog, then it will bark. All barking dogs will bark. So you, you, if you say all barking dogs bark, you haven't given me information. Just repeat it. It's a redundancy. Let me just explain this thing. I've, I've said redundancy about five times already. In an office, if they say there is a redundancy, they lay people off. Because it means you are there. If you are inside, it's not full. If we take you out, too, it's not empty. <laughs> if you have that posture to life, classroom lecture, group work, wherever you find yourself in a relationship, you there, if they add you, eh, you and you like it when you are labeled that way. You have to know that redundancy can catch you. You have to be very, very relevant. Not imposing yourself, but you have to be relevant. The point is, it, if there is a redundancy, we lay people up because they are not adding or subtracting. Have that idea now and then come to our, well, that's what a tautology is. When you ask me, Doc, what is critical thinking? And I tell you, critical thinking is when you are critical in your thinking. I said nothing. It's redundant. This person is doing something like that and your friend did a good job on that when he responded, uh, Francis said. When you say all back in those back, you haven't amplified, you haven't given me information. Information means you are telling me something that adds to the subject. We are going there shortly. So when I speak, Kofi is a boy. Not Kofi. For you to get some information, additional information about Kofi. Okay. So Kofi is a boy and it's a nature. It gives information about Kofi. There's an attribute that I am adding to the reference called Kofi. So this is not a redundancy. I have informed you. I've given you knowledge. But if you say Kofi is Kofi, you haven't added anything to the subject or the reference class that you had. So the subject hasn't received any amplification. You haven't amplified it, you haven't added to it. That is what is happening also in the second instance, where I say triangle. Look at tri means three. Angle. <laughs> so if I say a triangle has three sides, it's a, it's a tautology. Having said anything, you should clap. And as soon as I said a triangle, it meant three sides because angles are formed when sides meet. So two sides meet here, two sides meet at the top, two sides meet on the other extreme. That is what three sides mean, triangles, three sides. You are repeating yourself. A square has four sides. You are repeating yourself, okay? I say you are repeating, meaning that you are not and then two. It's just a repetition of the subject in the predicate. And typically to see it very well is what you see in example three, A is A. When you speak this way, you are not informing me. This is a linguistic truth. You can say it is non-informative. It is not informing, okay? It's a non-informative truth. This is necessarily true in all instances. If it's a flying bed, then it will fly. So if you say a flying bed flies, you said nothing. You just wasted our years. Until read now. These, these are true by meanings, definition, or logical structure. This means truths have no bearing on actual existence. Take note of that. I said, they have no bearing on actual existence. You don't say anything about the thing being there. I told you, it doesn't attribute anything. So I could say, Chichi is Chichi. 
And that is necessarily true. And we don't know what it is. Cha -cha. I can say cha-cha is cha-cha and chocho -cho is chocho. -cho. Everything I've said is true. <laughs> and yet it has no bearing on what? Actuality, actual existence for us to get information. Remember knowledge is information. You are sick. Remember how we started from absolute skepticism. We said that can't be sustainable. But we says knowing anything is impossible. And then we came to philosophical skepticism and the common sense skepticism. We said because knowledge is possible, we have to look at how we know. In fact, what knowledge itself is. Justify true belief. This is levels 100 and 200. You see that? And you, you are built on them till you go to level 300. So I'm building on that. What is knowledge? Justify true belief, at least traditionally. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. how do we come to know the two sources we have been engaging? Then how do we justify the claims of knowledge? So we, knowledge is bringing in information of a kind that we can try to find how to justify it and accept it. Now you come and tell us things that if you look at it properly, it's not informing us, meaning it's not adding anything to what it presumed to know. So there's a subject that you are seeking. I can ask you with an example of a non-informative or redundant truth. Explain why, uh, uh, whatever, it's a blah, blah, blah. You are writing it. <laughs> we'll say that this one has, <laughs> because we are let someone hide this one has no, hey, please you don't speak, please don't worry. I'm, I'm just teasing people that they thought I'm going to complete the sentence. So that they write it down, I, I'm, I'm done. But I've emphasized because it is important. These have no bearing on actual existence. And so they do not give content. Madame is going to read that. And so they are non-informative. They are true based on blah, 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 blah. Madame, finish it. They are not informative, form but not content. They are true based on the meaning, definition, etc. They are certain, but, but are they a priori or a posteriori? All right. So do you remember these two terms? They are certain, but this certainty associated with linguistic truth, or if you like, non-informative truth, is this certainty a priori certainty or a posteriori certainty? What does uh, what do these two terms mean or two expressions mean? A priori. Oh, I developed the I. The prior right, I've left I at the end of this, and then a posterior right, just like this one. Okay, I'm told that the pronunciation, the Latin proper is a priori. I said, yeah, I think this more than I'm eating. I should go. <laughs> they to do a priori, eh, a prior right, or a posterior right. Okay, now help me remember how we distinguish the two. What is a priori knowledge versus a posteriori knowledge? Quickly. 129 people. Hmm. I've waited enough for. Don't want people to lose marks. Jarvis, watch it, say, go ahead. Okay. In the a priori knowledge means knowledge gain prior to experience. And a posteriori knowledge, knowledge gain through experience. Through experience. Well done. That is it. So you see that a priori and a posteriori are talking about how we know. They are not talking about the nature of that statement, what the statement is, whether the statement is synthetic or analytic. I want to say it again. We have just seen some non-informative statement that Madame read. Non-informative, we call them also logical statement. And we say they are even logical redundancies. They are statements that do not add anything. They are by the analysis of it. Analysis means break them down. When you break the very words that we put together to create a statement, you will get the meanings. And therefore, you can tell its truth value. 
either necessarily true or necessarily false. They have necessity associated with them. That is the certainty with which we see if it is true, it will be always true tautology. And if it is false, it will be always false contradiction. They have that strict certainty associated with them, necessity, uh, necessity associated with them. These ones, we call them analytic truths. So it describes the nature of the statement, analytic statement, versus the other one that informs you. So instead of saying A is A, I could have said A is B. I'm sure we'll get to that shortly. I could have said A is B. A is B will be informative. So it will be synthetic. It means you've gone outside of the subject and you have brought an additional something that adds to the subject. So you are not repeating the subject in the predicate. You are not saying A is A, Kofi is Kofi. Eh, eh, virtually repeating development is development. You know, you are not saying that. You are saying Kofi is a boy. Or Kofi is the lecturer. When you say that Kofi is the lecturer, you are adding something which you got outside of the subject because you are not repeating the very goofy there. Synthetic hair, if we were at the lecture, I would have shown you. Borrowed hair <laughs> means it is outside of the original natural that you have. A synthetic means it is not part of you. This one you are wearing, okay, so synthetic, external to it. Now, synthetic truth means the subject and the predicate are saying two different. The subject is receiving additional amplification from what? The predicate. If that happens, that statement becomes a synthetic one. The other one we, we engage is analytic. So analytic synthetic only describes the nature of the statement, whilst a priori a posteriori, according to your friend Jarvis, is not telling you the nature of the statement, but it's telling you how you come to know that statement. The contention between rationalists and empiricists is not on the nature of the statement, it's on how you came to know that which you know and where you sourced it from. And this is what, what I've just done, is what can't Immanuel Kant, Immanuel spelled with an I, tried to show the folks that you people should clarify the language you are using. Otherwise, you, you think you are fighting and be throwing bombs at yourselves, and it is just a matter of confusion in how you are speaking. If you just clarify, you will see that synthetic analytic is a different level of distinction than a priori, a posterior. And so don't immediate this Immanuel Kant's mediation between the two extremes, as I'm summarizing for you like that. Yeah? So, so don't immediately think that if a statement is synthetic in nature, now it's clear to you where there's an amplification. If it's synthetic, an experiential truth. See that it's a statement about experience. Why do we say that? Because it adds to it. So there is information given about the subject. So it's an experiential truth. It's an informative truth. It, is, it has content, et cetera. Now Kant tells you, don't think that when you have a synthetic truth, because it is truth about experience, it will therefore mean that it will be what? A posteriori known necessarily. No. Kant thinks you can have a synthetic truth in other words, an experiential truth, an information giving truth, a knowledge statement, if you like. Yet we know it with logical necessity. Well, I can't. Yes, can say so. It says slow down, everybody run. Slow, 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 slow. Messi has landed. Forget about uh, children like uh, <laughs> zero and uh, who. Where, where are they at this crowd? I've forgotten all their names. It's only messy I remember. Forget, forget about them. Slow down. I will explain very well. Don't think that when you hear analytic truth, remember, they are 
logical necessities, then it necessarily means it, you know it with what? A priori certainty, not necessarily the case. So he comes in with such a revolution to diffuse the demarcation. What is this demarcation? That if it is synthetic, then because it's observation or it's about experience, then we know it via experience, a posterior. And then if it is analytic, then because it's linguistic, then it must necessarily be independently of experience, a priori. Our friend says, no, 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 slow down. There can be crisscrosses. There can be synthetic, a priori truth. So the knowledge is informative. It has added to the, the subject. So the predicate has amplified the subject. It's not just a repetition like A is A, or somebody you are saying something like every event must have a cause. God exists. It is wrong to kill indiscriminately and stuff like that. Supposedly being experiential in nature because they are not a repetition of the word. They are not analytic or logical redundancies. I just gave you instance. And yet, synthetic as they are, they are, they are known how a prior. In other words, they are known prior to experience, interpreted as what? With logical necessity and ap applies what? In other words, it has a certain degree of certainty attached to it, yet it is an experiential truth. If it's experiential, it should be contingent, sometimes true, sometimes for. But this one is not that type, synthetic, and yet known without the help of experience, and known with what? Logical necessity. That is what Kant's contribution, which we'll be doing maybe after Descartes' rationalism, uh, uh, before the before the IE Descartes and then after the IE, we'll come to uh, Kant and then close up the, the discussion by showing how Kant mediates, clarifies, shows the seeming confusion in his mind and then synthesizes the two extremes and shows them perhaps you can't do uh, you know, a mind without an accompanying experience all at once. But the kind of explanation he gives to do that is what is a bit woo. And then his advocacy for a transcendental idealist posture. All right, roll back. So what we saw here was just a prior, a posture. Right? And then I put that you shouldn't do a prior, a posture. Right? Then you think it necessarily means analytic synthetic, no. Distinguish how we know from what is known. Quickly, please, uh, let me get someone else. Okay, so let's have Matthew. Matthew read for us. First, where is uh, Samuel's hand? Samuel, your hand just went there, I tied it. Okay, Matthew will read, then Agnes Donko be on standby. Matthew, read quickly, please. Don't come around. Ah, okay, don't go. Eh? I saw your hand up earlier. Oh, your question is sorted. No, please. I wanted to read. Oh, then please read. Ah, please read. I thought it was a question. I wanted to mop up nicely before I take your question. Go ahead. Please read somewhere. Okay, please. Summary. Rationalists believe that there are at least some non-linguistic truths, synthetic or informative statements that are known a priori or independently of experience. Example, every event must have a cause. It is wrong to kill indiscriminately. Two, empiricists think that all truths, linguistic and non-linguistic, are ultimately sourced from experience. Linguistic or logical truths may be necessary and universal, to be like analytic, yet they are they are known as sorry, they are known a posterior. It's so, posterior. A posterior, sorry. Hmm. So are so are the synthetic truths that are known a prior 
That so is question now. The continuation. Hmm. Yes, that is the continuation. So very good. So are there synthetic truths that are known a priori? That's the contention. That's the actual disagreement. Okay. Take note of universal necessary truths. They are the ones that we call analytic. A bachelor cannot beat his wife. That is certainly false. That is necessarily false. It will apply everywhere that we use the term. You can't have it another way. Two plus three will be five. Three kilograms of rice plus five kilograms of rice will be three plus five kilograms, will be eight kilograms necessarily because of the meanings of terms, meaning of add, meaning of equal to, et cetera. So these are all supposedly necessary and universal analytic truths. Yet the empiricists insist they are known a posteriori. How we know it is what a posteriori, through the senses, ultimately. So two plus three for the empiricists. I am not coming there to come and calculate. Or I'm going to look to tell whether a person who beat his wife, that bachelor who beat his wife, really beat his wife. I won't go and look even as an, as an empiricist. But it doesn't take away from my being empiricist because I believe that that knowledge of necessity was acquired ultimately via an a posteriori means. And that is where the contention is. Whereas the rationalist would say such truths not necessarily mathematical truth and even a, a geometrical work, those ones, but also metaphysical truth. Like God exists. God exists. You are not repeating the concept. You are amplifying the Godness. So God is an existing being. That's what you are saying. You have added to the concept. It's experiential. Yet, it is not known, according to certain rational, experiential. You know it innately as your rational nature. Already know. Rationally said, where, where, where is that happening? Is it here? It's not happening. <laughs> and that's their contention that they are pulling hairs over. Then Plato has not claimed that sense, the senses play absolutely no role in the acquisition of knowledge. One of you, you, you see how you have contributed. One of you said that even after I had done all the presentation, touched on what I feel is important in Plato's rationale. The person said, okay, the little I want to add, one of your friends said that, is that is the senses plays a role in helping to trigger, but it doesn't constitute the origin of knowledge for Plato. That is why he's so rational. This one, you, we have said it. Look on the screen, please, respectfully. That proper object of knowledge. The only proper object of knowledge or the only thing that can really be known is being, the world of being. This is the world of appearance or the world of becoming. Okay, so being, the world of form, the world of essence. I've said all that. I, I'm just showing you. Okay, this is Plato proper now. Mm -hmm. This means that for Plato, we can have no real knowledge of the physical world around, about us where there is what? Relative and fluctuating world of what becoming. This are his I said you can go play my recordings on a PAC 102 philosophical question. You see the a playlist today for your own revision. Okay. World of being versus world of becoming. This is Plato. Of this world, we have only opinion, not knowledge. No certainty if we depend on the physical world of becoming. Everything is becoming something. The new shirt you put in your wardrobe is only becoming a rag. That fine sister who doesn't want anyone to even say hi and give her a high five because she has victorious whatever in her palm. That palm is only becoming six feet. It's in the process of dying. The day you go, we were born and then we started dying. If you don't know, ask our friend and beloved at you. It's only becoming something. Everything is passing away. So the fine car is only becoming ashes in no time. Haven't you seen part of your father's car that that car that you couldn't even touch? The top of it, that they, they have used it to do goal posts at your area. The, the small children have put it there in the playboard. That car, that time, if you even touch it with your church dress car, 
go and lean on it, you are in trouble. It has become useless. That is the world of becoming. It's not real. Two, in this physical world of blah, 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 we have said all this, okay? The constant distraction of the body. That's what you see there, which I elaborated on earlier. Then only death can stop our souls. That's the mind. That's the intellect. That's reason. That's spirit. Anything, the label you want to give to it, okay, mind. It is only death that can stop mind, which has been entrapped in this physical body. I use the plural, so I think that's why I said have been. The souls that have been entrapped in their physical bodies. See the expression, it's a trap. The, the, the soul is trapped and can't feel free. Remember uh, Paul again, the good I want to do, I cannot do. The bad I don't want to, that's what, oh, wretched man that I am. Hmm? There's a constant struggle. It is an entrapment. The clarity with which you would have viewed the world, you are not having that because the, the, the container blurs your vision and it is constantly distracted. You have to get up and bath. Well, if you don't do that, that Goku will spoil the anointing. So you are fasting, you have risen high, but if you want to go and pray, cut up high with others, you have to go and brush. And so that short time can distract you. And then you, you, you drop from the spiritual high and then <laughs> and descend body distractions from the contamination and distortions and illusions and relativities of the sensible world. You have to pick them. They will help you when you are writing your essays. Then you put flesh to the abstractness. Otherwise, it will be all abstract. But philosophy that is hanging in the abstract world is useless. It has to be relevant in everyday practical. I was telling the level 200s yesterday that hmm, the discussions we are having in the course so far all border on this. Even level 400 uh, contemporary issues are going to discuss the problem of God. And when we put our course outline or put those content, we didn't know we were going to have this techie thing in the Syria, you know, unfortunate, you know, incidences. The problem of God and evil. And people might think that, ah, every day we want inflation and this and that. They say the problem of God. So right now that our brother has gone to that kind of gruesome, very, well, I don't know how to put it, painful as it like that. You think there is nothing beyond the physical? All that there is is this banku and who goes to that you have eaten bed. You are sitting there, nothing. This world there, any name, name, passing through, passing through. Really? Reflect. A little, it will make you sober. It will make you focused on essentials, and as much as possible, it might make help you make some decisions that are, you know, forthcoming for the, the short time that we may be here. I say short because no matter how long it is, if we are 80, 89, 90 years, for some people, the prayer topic. Amongst your family, people, your children, your grandchildren, is when will grandpa or grandma die? Ah, 96. You can't talk. For example, some have are so blessed, they get to 120, they are still strong and they are dead. But generally speaking, the day you, you say, oh, grandpa, when we check that thing, he's gone. Grandpa is one, two, three years sitting in the room. Every morning, so you have to go and dry him in the sun. The one going to dry him is his first one. She's 76. She herself, her waist. She herself is a great grandma. What kind of control? God? People will even pray that God, please take him home today for us. Take him home. The day he says he's going, say, Oh, glory to Jesus. Oh, glory. And quickly. <laughs> we won't stay long on the set. Descend, reflect. It is rationalism. It's not church. We'll do more at church. But even in our philosophical class, a little reflection will make you stress-free, Kakra. I mean, determined, purposeful, what have you, but unnecessary. Look at what is happening upstairs of Ghana. What what, what are people fighting over? Have you thought about it? What? Oh, look at our friend in this thing, Russia, and then the one in Ukraine. What are, I've not followed them for a while now, because school is in session, you, you don't have a life. Imagine, what at all? 
Is anybody looking for in this world? How long will you be here? Reflection, philosophical reflection. Soberly done. Don't be doing it when you are looking for an iPhone, something, something. You are bent on taking somebody's wife or somebody's husband. Just an example. Meanwhile, you already know, says Plato, it is wrong. Nobody should tell you. Don't look at them, try and rush up, throw the thing. You two you are standing there, no one asks you. No one even know that, knows that that is what you are doing. But you are in the mirror, you say, but me too, the way the life is right now, it's not me. Like, who are you telling? If you are okay in your head about it, keep doing. When you see dog, say this one is a table. When you see cow, say, oh, it is a butterfly. Say that and continue doing it. When you can see the maternity, I said it last weekend, my friends, uh -huh, last two weeks in person. This is main campus, so I don't have to repeat it. Then you are intentionally glossing over what you can see. Not physical seeing you. This is Plato now. What should anyone do to you? Continue. But a little reflection can make us a little bit more sober. And some little daily bread, a little fun here and there is fine. But regulation, subtleness, calmness will help. Agbashet, actual who is man. Take off shirt. Let's show who is the man. I'll be the man. You'll be the at trotter station. Before you know it, your your cheek has changed its direction <laughs> into another thing. Where are you going with all this plenty? Death on my screen now. The day this body lies down and can raise its hand, you will see that you wasted your time. You wasted your time with all this bleaching for Johnny Bravo. You didn't even see it. Focus on the essentials. Have fun. Live peaceably with all men. And when the short time, 100 years old, 122, 3 years old, 31, like our friend, when the time is up and you go, you go peacefully, liberated, <laughs> excuse me, from the entanglement of the senses. That is what true philosophers desire. Not somebody who does a course in university called philosophy. Philosopher, as in a thinker, a reflector, someone who meditates, someone who's not driven by emotions and dogma, someone who questions and receives reason ground. So you don't have to come and do philosophy to be called a philosopher. Our elderly folks, some of them are deep sages, deep reflectors. Look at Jesus and the answers he gave to people. I don't know the Quran very well. I don't want to presume to know something. You're an authority. If you don't say things well, you undermine yourself and the institution. That is why I would have quoted from there. People of season, they are seasoned and they impact lives because they look at the pertinent matters. Plato says, only then, it is only after death, when there's that total disconnect, not a disconnection that comes back like a dream, for example, or you meditate a little and after the 40 days and 40 nights, you are so spiritual. When they ask you, how are you, my brother? I said, the Lord of the mountain of holy sin tea. Everything is fine. Hey, brah. Right? <laughs> right after three days, four days, where is Bra? He's at the back there sniffing the thing. Hey, we thought you were going to the mountains and come. Because the body, the body. But when there is total disconnection, then you can have clarity and you can be totally liberated to acquire true, absolute, uninterrupted love. So you know how we have some innate ideas inborn. It's not every knowledge per se. Please look on the screen, okay? Not every knowledge per se, but at least certain fundamental ideas or principles are built right into the mind itself. Mind, remember, can be soul. Mind is not brain. So the non-physical is what we are talking about. The it has in it already, as part of its nature, what fundamental ideas or principles. The innate ideas we talked about, I say I've, I've now put a note there. 
already inbuilt. So the phone you buy before you even start loading data to put uh, you know numbers or pictures or what have you on it. When you buy it fresh from showroom and bring it home, it has inbuilt in it certain principles. So the human mind, the human soul, the human being, the world of being, see, not the world, the human becoming, but the world, human being, your being, your reality, the soul, you, has in it certain fundamental, they are basic, they don't have to be the complex one, the basic ideas and principles already integrated in it or built into it and require only to be developed and brought to maturity. So the ideas are there. You only have to develop it and bring it to maturity, grow it. So if you take the egg and you eat it, remember my example last two weeks, or maybe three weeks, I don't remember, but at, at our main campus in the lecture hall there. When you take the egg and you think that all you see is an egg, a poultry egg, whether chicken or whatever, you have lost an important thing, remember, for Plato, that egg is essentially a chicken. So you can convince yourself that, ah, today I had two whole chickens on my rice. Charlie, I'm not a poor person like that. I've eaten two whole chickens, essentially speaking. <laughs> Why? Go you add two eggs, whole chicken. Until it attains maturity, you are still essentially that big man that God has made you. What we see right now is the in the making, you are in the process. Mm -hmm. The cassava dough and the corn dough that is sitting on the table looking useless is just a matter of time. Give me some 30 minutes. You'll be shocked how you encounter Zerubbabel's mountain food. But when it's sitting there, it looks all discarded. The essence is there. You will need this to critique some uh, uh, criticisms that will come from empiricists that are, ah, why is that children don't exhibit knowledge of those supposed innate ideas? Because the child can walk naked, can even go and take mommy's phone and throw into water and shout bubbles, bubbles. And if the child already knows what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, why do they behave that way? That is John Locke. I'm going to give that work to do. I will submit a reading response for it. The criticisms leveled by empiricists like John Locke against the theory of innate ideas. Okay, and I'm saying that you need this is my long elaboration on this slide to do a good job at that. I've already given you inclinations of, of it. What am I saying? The child, essentially speaking, knows, but may not have attained maturity. Just like the egg, essentially, is a chicken. It just hasn't evolved to its full maturity. And Plato is an essentialist, so he's not concerned about the accidentals that look different. You are essentially your father's son. Grow a little and we'll see your hair, your, your genes, your posture, your present, how you present yourself, you know, your colors. But when they give birth to you first, you rely on the bed there. You see that you look all, sometimes you even look white. Babies, fresh babies. Sometimes they look like white, a white man's. So if people don't believe, they'll say, hey, the sister too. Your husband is black like that. You are black like that. Okay, dark like that. And then your child is all white like that. It's just a matter of time. The reality will evolve it's out of it. So it starts as Auntie Mabel Naki. We all heard what you said. If you were giving your chachiko a case, it would have been public. <laughs> keep, keep it muted. Okay. I'm just joking about that one. Right. So innate ideas telling you that the ideas could be there. We have either forgotten or they are yet to evolve and mature. And so the fact that it is not being expressed by whether the child or the idiot 
or you and I, who we claim we are not idiot, but I believe we all have a certain sense of idiot <laughs> yeah, in us, because a brother can receive a slap from my sister. Oh, could you, could you, and say, slap me again. Idiot. Is it idiocracy or idiocy? <laughs> you see, we have expressed that when we know very well that we shouldn't copy in the exam. And so when we start copying, we are looking left and right. Knowing may not necessarily imply doing, whether for children, idiot or adult, normal people. So it is neither here nor there. That is every butter, <clears throat> excuse me, to the criticism that one can raise against Plato. Someone raises that against Plato and then Plato can react that look, knowing may not necessarily imply doing because essentially it can be known and yet we need it to mature. Or I can know that I shouldn't take that good as a gift because that gift will compromise my judgment. I can know it and yet not do what I know to be right. That doesn't mean I didn't know. Innate knowledge is talking about knowledge. The thing is there. It didn't say people do. It says people know. If you want to critique that and say our ah, children are not doing what you say uh, they should be doing if they know the right thing. It's a different question. And you see how I've dealt with that. The child may know. The idiot may even know but not be able to express what he knows. A good defense for Plato, I think. So example of such innate ideas, mathematical concept, triangles, like equality, largeness, triangles, the moral concept like goodness, virtue, piety, metaphysical truth like causality. Okay, now we are done. See, Plato's, uh, Plato continued, knowledge as recollection. You did that job as a class for me. So no much work there. The only way to, so let's get a read of those slides and then I'm sure I tight on everything. We can go home and rest. 122, you are more than 200 plus. I'll, I'll check again. If I do the quiz. Magdalene, my dear, please read. Madam, please, you are more than that. Uh, you are more, I'm going to the side to check. Just to give you, so if 122, let's say some are even sharing gadgets, so there are 200 of you, so people will lose, and I won't open it again. That is why I, I, I cautioned. I, I've done my best. Okay, Mark didn't read. Let's finish it so that people can go and rest. Please read for me, thank you. Okay. For knowledge as recollection. The only way who was in the presence of the form? Oh, I think, had knowledge I'm, of the I'm sorry. Hold on for a minute. I'm, so, I have special students okay. who try to assess con content. So please read it again and be stable so that they can hear too. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Four, knowledge as recollection. The only way to account for this knowledge is to believe that prior to its embodiment in this world, the soul was in the presence of the forms where it acquired knowledge of the reality, including knowledge of equality. That's pre-existence. Yes, very good. I don't think that we need any further elaboration of, of this. So if you say that these are some extractions and if you like some uh, uh, analysis we are making, the only way to account for this knowledge, which knowledge is that? The knowledge of, rec uh, the, to claim that we recollect, mm? the only way to account for this knowledge is to believe that prior to its embodiment, before, we took on a body in this world. The soul was in the presence of the forms. 
where it acquired knowledge of the realities, including knowledge of equality. So we are saying that for you to have already known, so that in this physical world, we when you, you, you get the knowledge, we are saying that, oh, it's just a matter of recollection, remembering something that is already there. If you already knew it, then it means that before you took on body, physical body, you already knew. And so it's not surprising to hear, before you were a blood clot in your mother's womb, I knew you. That's a rationalist talk. People don't know. If you understand rationalism, as you have engaged in, I knew you and had ordained you as a prophet to the nations. <laughs> before mommy and daddy got busy, before means before, daddy couldn't corn. He doesn't know how to, you know, say, yeah, me love you, me love you. He doesn't know that. When he was busy fumbling, looking for ways to go and tell mommy that, you know, you are the apple of my eyes, the brightness of this day. God. So we are talking the a, a, a Christian version. And this is true for almost every religion. Before that thing happened, whether it happened several times or once, or pa, 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 I tell you, God says, I knew you and was speaking to a specific person. There were several instances. On to ask a son, okay, so a, the virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son. They are telling you something that is going to happen. If, if you think that it is now going to happen, you are joking. There was silence in heaven. They said, who will go and die? Before it happened. So this way of speaking, at least from Plato's viewpoint, suggests a certain sense of pre-existence. And it is a, a, I don't want to say deduction, but an analysis. If you knew before you took on the body, and I'm not talking, talking Bible, and I'm talking Plato, then you would have had to exist in a certain form somewhere. Definitely not with body, because it didn't have body. To pick the ideas of true beauty, true justice. That's why I'm telling you that if you are, you are arguing this way, you cannot pretend to say that, oh, after all, me, my goat is my wife. Society cry, they have passed the law. You have passed the law. With which hand and which leg are you using to pass which law? You yourself, when were you born? That is the, the, the point. You should know already. If you have become so depraved morally and you know humanly depraved in your actual life, trying to go and do some self climbing out of the cave. I'm talking Plato. And check and see if we haven't gone too far away from what we already know to be right, to be just, to be perfect, to be beautiful, to be harmonious, you would have already pre-existed to be able to have already known in Plato's term. So that's the second paragraph. This knowledge was lost or forgotten through the trauma of death. So, to some degree, recollected, subsequent to birth on the occasion of our experience with a particular instance of equality or beauty, for example. Hey, excuse me. Thank you, my lady. What time are we supposed to? Are we not supposed to close at 3.30? Anna? Yes, my lady. Yes, hey. yes, 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 Tied my soul somewhere. <laughs> eh? so, oh. are, Adam, uh, look, are you yes. got my hand to talk about that? Some no, no, people no, no, were no. complaining. But what is the point of complaining? Oh, it's not even the they complaining. Were having class, another class. They leave. Ah, in in the university, does anybody tell you that you have left a class before? Oh no, no, you should me, I should rather complain. How much did you pay me that I should be teaching beyond the thirty like that? Yeah. <laughs> about the assessment and then uh, about the assessment. Now can the lecturer set an assessment outside of her time? That's illegal. 
You are a philosopher. Don't I, it can't be. We like we like to right. think uh, last for it. Oh, that be that. Is that I mean, the advantage. I'm just saying. It. You know what happened? I have to take my medicine. I'm not feeling too well, so I I I just got a prompt on my phone. Say you have delayed by 15 minutes. I said, ah, how can I deliver? I'm teaching. When I finish the teaching, I'll take the medicine. Then I check the time. Ah, you people, you have overpaid. Next week we'll start 30 minutes late. Okay, so, but we are done. <laughs> <I'll give> you... <laughs> Don't whenever there is time <laughs> class, you go. It's a contract. Okay, I mean, you do fine. So the assessment that because of that people came, the class size was still 122. I went to check on Sakai. The people, this this one is a chat. So those who have to go should go. Look, you are 280. If you think I'm joking, let me show you. 280. Oh, oh my class now. I know how to set my questions, Brian and Jadwa. How I set my questions, like if you don't attend the test, you won't do well to show. Maybe you get B when you could have gotten a straight A. There are 280 students registered in an elective in a branded. Why? Is it is this the only course in the in the in the trend? What am I showing uh, through this? People, talk to your friends. Eh? Look at this is the number. See. Main campus bill for rationalism. Rationalism should be 32 or 30, something like that. You give essays within three days, you have finished grading, and you should all 280 of people, 80 people have come to see that. <laughs> you are coming to do rationalism. Okay, I think we should end so that people can rest. I have to take my own medicine now. So, but we are done. Look at the slide. You see that we are done. I only over elaborated and I thought that I should give you all that information. And people who are complaining there, it's complaining that I should give them breast milk or something. You are in the university, so nobody can come and sit on your neck. That <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> this is like, I mean, this is university. And I say, I tell you that me, I say, I'm coming to give assignment. So, when my time is finished, cry, I sit down. Who does that? most especially a personality like myself yes my brother we are done those who have to go or you, you need to go please feel free eh? but i will take the few queries and then go, go ahead sir go, go ahead sir someone said dog and i who my fans we yeah, are done so my dad talked like about that. okay I, we are done i recollected and then already known so in this slide i'll do some questions from there that you will answer just like the other one we did look on the screen now this one to the same loss critique that I talked about is here. So find a synthetic analytic versus a prior, a posterior. You see that I've done that with you also. Then Plato's theory of recollection grants an advantage to the empiricist. Why or why not? If we recollect that after the a prompt by the senses, then doesn't it make it look as if the senses actually start the process of Don't you think it could be a critique reflect on those? Thank you very much. All the best and take care. What you do next is Descartes rationalism next week. Whilst you read to respond to Locke's critique against Plato. I wish you well. All right, Doc. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Ah, ah. Bravo,